Welcome to the future, uh, data analytics. Uh, my name is Jack McKenzie. Uh, I'm a former TV journalist, a former TV consultant, and now I run a market research firm. Uh, PSB, I think I might have something about us, uh, is an international uh, research house. We have offices in uh, Washington, D.C., where we conduct our political practice, New York, where we conduct the ma majority of our corporate practice, Seattle, which is our tech practice, and I'm based in Los Angeles, and not surprisingly, because of that, I run our media and entertainment practice. We have some fun clients. Uh, and while a lot of uh, students are taught and, and encouraged to go into the businesses of media, there is a neat career on the companies that work with the businesses of, of media and supply the research and the analytics to them. Because in my day, I get to work, talk to Apple in the morning, Twitch in the afternoon, help a new company find a, a way to sell movie tickets, help another company try to identify new target audiences, all in one day. And so while you're, the kids in the room, while you're thinking about your careers, think about the, we call it the supplier side. I'd like to eliminate the word vendor. Uh, the supplier <laughs> side um, to the media companies that will use your work uh, to be more successful. And we do things like this. I'm not going to go into great detail. There was some talk this morning. But we're involved in data analytics at the zip code, at the household level. Now, we don't necessarily know who they are, but we know what they are. We know what they do, and we know <laughs> how they might think about a piece of content or about a business proposition, and we help our clients identify those areas, not only those people, those types of people, but also how to reach them on various platforms, including your social media feed to a billboard that you drive by um, as you're heading to work or to, in many cases, the movie theater. Um, we have lots of ways of visualizing. I will tell you the, the presentation this morning by Dr. Stansberry and my daughter Madison, which I was quite proud of. Um, couldn't have been more timely for the business, for the industry, both on the academic side and on uh, the professional side, which is this wide range of skills, technical skills. I think it was referred to as hard skills and soft skills. There is no universal language. I still get emails from my client at Apple that I can't open because we're a PC, Microsoft-based house, and I get things in pages, but I can't open them in Word. Um, we have clients who are, uh, Jamal wants us to work in Tableau, so we do. We have other clients who only want us to work in Excel, so we do. And, but we have to know how to do all of those things, and so the, 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 the growing knowledge base about what employers need and what needs to be taught um, is is critical, and um, it was a, a great learning. I hope I hope Elon continues that research because that could really serve both sides of the industry quite well. Um, but enough about PSB and the supplier side. We've got experts here. We have the people who actually are at those companies um, that you see uh, every day, marketing to you in a way to get you to do something, usually something quite fun. Um, but to do something, um, and they are using data analytics to do it. Uh, in order, and sorry, I'm going to do this because, well, I know these people well. I don't, I don't memorize their resumes. Jamal Salman is the Vice President of Data Analytics and Marketing at Paramount Pictures. He's at the front uh, line of guiding a very traditional media company into this brave new world of using media analytics Uh, I don't. I don't actually have a slide for that, but we'll we'll do that. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, Jamal was a sports management graduate from Syracuse and has built his career at such places as ESPN, Netflix, and Google. Patricia Marsden 
Uh, she looks young, but Patricia has 20 years of research experience, including sports, local news, national news, and now has taken her skill set to the banking industry. Uh, deep media Patricia was deep in the media space when the transition started from pure ratings analysis, was pretty much all TV did 20 years ago, uh, into the integration of acquiring data sets, figuring out what those data sets mean, um, and how to turn those into decisions and strategies, both at a corporate level and more specifically at a station-by-station -station level with different markets at Scripps. How many stations? Um, 33. 33 different stations in 33 different markets. So the, the managing of that data was, um, was quite a, a proposition. Um, and she's now at U.S. Bank in Cincinnati, so she has the opportunity to tell us um, what it looks like from the outside um, <laughs> as rather uh, as an insider. And Vinny Brusezzi, is that the way to say it? Brusezzi. Brusezzi. Um, is kind of one of a kind and was way ahead of his time. Vinny and his team years ago um, created his own big data set, uh, believing that there was more science, uh, uh, there should be more science to the creation of movie scripts. Vinny and his team coded uh, line by line, scene by scene, character by character uh, movies. And through that uh, creation believed and turned out to be true, could make small changes to movie scripts that could have big impact on their box office performance. Uh, and now Vinny is on the precipice of one of the neat stories in Los Angeles. Um, he's within 45 days of opening the newest uh, movie studio in Los Angeles, Solstice Studios, um, that is, has promised its uh, investors that it will be a data analytics driven studio. It's how decisions are gonna be made, it's how movies are gonna be marketed, um, and it's how success is gonna be found. I noticed uh, you didn't say I look young. What's that? You didn't say I also look young, you didn't. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't, didn't, but I could have. You could have. Yeah, I, I, I saved one for everybody. Okay. Thanks, one, yes. I appreciate that. Um, and we're gonna start with Jamal to tell us about his, his, uh, his work at Paramount, and then we'll come down the line, and then we'll start with, uh, we'll go into questions and answers. Great, thanks, Jack. I'll start a little uh, high level here. Um, you know, great. So I'll start a little high level as to what it is that our team does, um, how that might differ from what the traditional research team does. By that, I just mean market research at, at Paramount. Um, we actually are two separate organizations, and some companies are the same organization. So I'll kind of talk through the differences there and some of the how we how we work together and tackle the same things. So if you think about, uh, and I'll just put it under not too long ago, definitely true at the time that uh, Paramount released Titanic, uh, there really were, on the market research side, three main ways to collect information, try to get an uh, understanding of our, our consumers. I, I don't have it listed there as film, it's content. Uh, but really the, the core areas, uh, focus groups, IDIs, which are normally one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and then surveys. So whether they're custom surveys that try to answer one specific question, or if they're trackers, so in the movie industry, you might be familiar with something called NRG, uh, which is a national survey that tracks percentage of people that say they're gonna probably see a movie, have heard of a movie, et cetera. Um, I used to work at ESPN. We also had a tracker that tracked uh, you know, how many fans there were of every single sport, how many fans there were of every team. Um, and that tracker actually at ESPN is over 30 years old almost at this point. Uh, so that really was all of the things that we were playing with, especially at the time of the Titanic, but uh, looking forward, if you look at our, our world now, if you can move one more, Jack. Thank you. If you look at our world now, it's very complicated, like so much so that I'm gonna have to turn over so I can read everything that's <laughs> up there on the slide. Uh, so the analytics role is, we like to think about it as um, us taking in untraditional data is kind of the term that we use. Uh, so some of the areas that we really dive into on a day-to-day -day basis, I'll just highlight a few of them there. You'll see there's Google search data, there's YouTube data, and I won't really go into what all of these things are. I think the point of this slide is that uh, you lived in a world where we had those three bubbles primarily, that's probably 90% of the insights there. Um, and 
I added nine additional bubbles there, and if I had more room on the slide, I probably could have put 30 different bubbles there of different types of data sets that we touch every single day. And this is why the analytics team has been created at Paramount, why it's, it's I think at this point, almost every studio, every TV network has created either a separate analytics team or added a analytic capability to their existing market research team, is because there's so much data to deal with uh, that we really need to understand these different data sets and how the advantages exist for these sets versus market research and really where the gaps are and how they re really can work together. And then the last thing I would say is uh, what do we ultimately do with this data? So interestingly enough, what we do with this data is really no different than mar what market research teams do with this data. It's all about trying to get as many people internally in the company to understand the voice of the consumer, to get an understanding of what's happening in the world outside of the walls. I think it's very easy to be stuck in your bubble. Uh, you know, when you work at a movie studio, or you work at a TV network, everyone in the building is 100% aware. Everyone in the building knows if one article goes up on Variety, everyone in the building knows, thinks the entire world has heard of this news story. Um, so the job of market research and analytics is to make sure that people have an understanding of what what the world actually looks like. Um, and to that point, we'll work with the creative teams, uh, the publicity teams, the media teams, the market research teams, and at Paramount specifically, uh, you know, historic, let's say maybe, let's say 10 years ago, this work was 90% domestic as far as focus. Uh, for us, in at least 20 markets, we'll say 12 of them are priorities. If we have a big movie, it might open up in 50 different countries. So you have to understand what's happening, but now you have to do that at a global scale. Uh, and that's really what we work on every day. So, you know, Jack introduced me uh, briefly, but you might have wondered when you saw my title, what on earth a banker is doing on a panel about data and analytics and media. Um, and Jack, if you go to the next slide uh, for me. When I stepped into banking two months ago, I was shocked at the parallels of what I had just experienced in 20 years in media. This is my bank's reason for being. We invest our hearts and minds to power human potential. Doesn't say anything about money, doesn't say anything about capital. I could put that reason for being in front of a media organization and with a couple of changes it would probably work. If you don't know much about banking, US Bank is the fifth largest consumer bank in America. Uh, the company's worth about $90 billion, give or take how much winning is going on in the stock market day to day. <laughs> when I came out of media, I was working at a company that was worth $1 billion. So I took my skill set and I went from a company worth $1 billion to a company worth $90 billion. And you and your students should think about that because I think my career is a really interesting statement about having a skill set that works across industries. If you are someone, or your students are those someones, who can look at a data set and find a pattern, tell a story, not just manage the work, because there's a lot of managers in big companies, but also do the work. You find that story, you bring it to your leadership, that's valuable, and that's not just valuable in media. It's valuable in banking, it's valuable in consumer packaged goods, it's valuable in fast food, it is valuable everywhere. So your students should understand coming out, and you students in the um, audience should understand coming out, that you're valuable people, and understand that value before you graduate, help your students understand that value before you graduate. So a little bit of soapbox there, I apologize. Um, at US Bank, um, Jack, if you could go to the next slide. We are also two different teams. There's an analytics team and a market research team. At the end of the day, data analytics is pushing us and pushing media companies too to move from what's on the left side of this page, which is a product-focused world, to what's on the right side of the page. Didn't make a good transition into the slide deck, Jack. It didn't, sorry, that's my, that's that's totally, my bad. That's totally Jack's fault, just so you know. <laughs> I thought um, you'd develop something new, prod. No, <laughs> no. You just step back from the PowerPoint, Jack. Um, Jack and I have known each other for years, so. Um, to, to a company that is consumer-focused, people-focused. I could put this slide 
in front of every media company in the country. They're trying to do the same thing and they're trying to have their data analytics take them there to really understand what their consumers are doing, not just what they say they're doing. Because when you ask a consumer a question, did you vote in the last election? And they say yes. And you go back and you say, like, check the voter rolls and yeah, maybe they missed the last one, right? Did you go to church on Sunday? Uh, no. Do you usually go to church? Oh, sure, totally, right? We're trying to use that to move from product focused, credit card, mortgage, you want this, you want this, you want this, to a place that is about the consumer first and putting products around them and not the other way around. Sounds a lot like media, right? Jack? Um, how I got here is kind of a weird progression and I, Jack asked me to bring some kind of uh, some perspective from outside of the media to this, so I will. Obviously, I've worked in media for 20 years. By the time um, I got to my end of my tenure at Scripps, at the EW Scripps Company, um, I was burned out. Um, so not only did I need a new challenge, I was looking for something else. Um, I had burned it at both ends for 20 years, and I had allowed that to happen to myself. At the very beginning of my career, I was also part of the huge problem in market research in media. Market research in media is not well done at all. And he and I are going to have a great discussion about this. I was part of that issue. Jack was part of that issue. No, I was not there. <laughs> um, market research in media has traditionally been about the product. What do you think about my product? Is my product important to you? How can I get you to use more of my product? Will you use my product at 6 and 10 and 11 and on your tablet and on your phone and on the internet? Me, 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 me. Please tell me how important my product is to you. Years and years and years and years of horrid market research practices in media. Almost never, until very recently, have there been questions like, What's going on in your life, consumer? Do you know people who live paycheck to paycheck? How are the schools in your community? What's your experience like in a, you know, working two jobs and having um, bills to pay and things like that? Jamal talked about being insular. As an industry for many, many years, we had no idea how real consumers actually live. Data analytics is wonderful because it tells us what consumers actually do and it helps move the business forward, but you still also need to understand what consumers are actually like and what their lives are like. Jamal has companies, Jamal's company had a quiet place come out this past weekend. Congratulations, Jamal. Um, you know, there are lots of Americans who can't afford 10 bucks to go to the movies. Right? They might be able to afford five bucks when it comes out on pay-per-view. Right? For years and years and years, we didn't even ask those questions of our consumers. And that's one of the reasons we ended up kind of being absolutely out of touch with the people we serve. Um, some, in my view, where companies have gone wrong, and I've seen this at a couple different places, as I said, too many bosses, not enough doers. Um, people who do are enormously valuable. We love bosses, we love managers, God bless them. I'm interested in people who can do the work and tell me what's important in the data, right? I've also met people who are amazing analysts but can't communicate particularly well to tell those results to other people. People talk about hard skills and soft skills. I think it's the wrong conversation. Good communication skills are not soft skills. Good communication skills are absolutely vital for the survival of the industry, whatever industry you're in. I don't care if you've got a Tableau workspace that's got 18 tabs in it. If you can't talk to somebody about what's in those 18 tabs, it does not matter. Once upon a time, I was a cub reporter. I was a cub reporter in Iowa, which was fun. You get to meet every person running for president ever when you're a cub reporter in the state of Iowa. It's amazing. I was like 21, like, hello, Lamar Alexander, how are you? It's great. My experience as a journalist makes me a better research and analytics person. I ask good questions. I am curious about people and what they do and why and what's going on with them. Soft skills is an outdated term. 
and I think we need to update what that is. Um, a couple other things, big is often better, but not always in terms of data sets, right? People who can take a critical eye to an input into a model, I think are very important. Garbage in, garbage out. At my last company, there was someone who was really pushing this data set that they wanted us to use about um, smart TV. It was a smart TV data set, really interesting data. It was also very upscale, very white, looked nothing like the people we were trying to serve. Is that data set good for us to use? No, because we're going to go down a primrose path that's the wrong path using that data set. Um, poor data education. Um, believe me, there are people who have been throwing out acronyms their entire career who have no idea what those acronyms mean, <laughs> right? Um, when you're putting together Tableau works, workspaces, there's got to be a data dictionary with those things, because believe me, there's people who don't know and don't want to ask. But please put those dictionaries in there, because poor data education, especially in a large publicly traded company, can lead to data misuse in a large publicly traded company that can get you into an enormous amount of trouble, especially in a highly regulated industry like banking. Right? Um, not enough links between market research and analytics. Um, one of my jobs at US Bank is to be one of those links. Data analytics folks are the smartest people I ever deal with, and I love it. Whenever I go into a room with data analytics folks, I'm like, yes. I'm not the smartest person in this room, and it's wonderful. They can tell me what and when and why and who. They usually can't tell me, they can't tell me why. They can't tell me about motivation. They can't tell me about what's going on in the background before that action happened or didn't happen. Those teams, when they're not on the same, in the same pillar, I don't think those links happen particularly easily and I don't know if that's a best practice for how we should be um, structured. But they need to happen because they, they absolutely have to connect. Um, and we've talked a little bit about very poor market research um, strategies. It just really, really poorly done for years and years and years. Um, hasn't served the industry well at all. Um, I've been fortunate in my media career that I've worked for some great, great companies. Um, you know, Scripps was a great place to work. If your students or you are looking for a job in local media, I would recommend them every day of the week. Cox Media Group, if you're looking for a job in local media, is also a great company. I think Cox Media Group is the best run local media company in the country if you want to get into local. Um, but working at NASCAR and now working at a bank has helped me understand that, you know, we got a lot of things we need to work on. But now that our analytics are really telling us about real people, Right? and hopefully matching that up with market research that serves the industry better, I feel like we're on a better track now than we were even two, two or three years ago. Vinny will use his brain with no so supporting evidence. No supporting. So impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never liked PowerPoint slides. Um, but I will, I guess, illustrate how I've got here by telling you a little bit about my personal journey and everything I learned kind of along the way in a small synopsis. So um, before selling my soul and coming to the movie industry, I was a professor in New York of uh, sociology and statistics. And um, when I entered into the movie industry, I was struck by, or horrified is probably the better word, by two things. Um, one, the decision-making process of how people decided to spend $200 million on a film based on their gut instinct. I mean, there's no <laughs> other industry in the world that would go, yeah, no, that, that, that makes works, sense. Sure. You know, Mars needs moms. Uh, let's make a movie about moms being kidnapped. Kids cried in the theater. Um, and they spent $200 million on this, which is a conceptually broken idea. No kid wants to see a movie about moms getting kidnapped, right? I mean, it makes sense. Um, but you spin yourself into thinking things, right? And so what consumer information is supposed to do is cut through spin. 
um, and cut through that self-belief that everything you have is the best thing in the world. And believe it or not, you know, everyone believes their baby is beautiful. I mean, when someone's, oh, look at my baby, no one ever says, oh my God, this is an ugly baby, right? Put the baby down. No one ever says that, right? But your job as a reader is to tell people their baby's ugly sometimes because there are ugly babies out there. Whether, you know, it's like a haircut, you know, it's like, oh, how's, you know, it looks nice. And where it says your haircut looks like crap. But sometimes <laughs> it does. Our job is to tell people the hard truth. And in this industry, people don't tend to want to hear the hard truth. Um, and so the second thing I was horrified by was what were the methods that were used to tell these hard truths? And it was market research. And looking at market research, as uh, you were just saying, um, we, were, we were looking at sample sizes, for example, of, of 300 people nationwide, broken down by males and females over under 25, 75 in each quad. Well, that's an error rate of 11.3% plus or minus. Like you wouldn't listen to a poll that said plus or minus 11.3%, but they were making these million dollar decisions of, and they still do to this day, that is the general sample size of, let's test a TV ad, um, you know, we'll have 11 TV commercials, let's test 11 of them and find out which one we should use to, to put our medium dollars behind. Sample size of 300 for each. Oh, this one scored two percentage points higher? Oh great, let's go with that one. It, it's, it's, it really is astonishing. Um, the lack of sophistication that's used, and it, and it hasn't changed. Um, the, the questions asked and the methods haven't changed that much. So um, after getting over, getting over that horror and um, not being the greatest personally at those soft skills that she was talking about, um, it's kind of hard when you, gen I, I genuinely don't like people, right? But um, I prefer them as numbers on, on a piece of paper. Uh, than having to talk to them, but you have to, I guess. So, uh, you know, I had to learn those soft skills. As you can see, I've improved a lot in, in 20 years. Yeah. It's really grown. I've yeah. grown a lot. Um, it is. It? It's, it's personal growth. Um, but uh, I decided to focus on on two things because fixing all of market research was going to be difficult, particularly in an industry that used numbers as a weapon. Uh, numbers were used to prove that one person's idea is better than another person's idea. Um, and so you blame the research or, or not. Um, and so I realized that there were two things that were missing. One was by the time the content was made, the ship had sailed. Um, so you'd spend $200 million or $150 million or whatever it is on a movie concept, you know, um, John Carter goes to Mars or whatever, and, and if it's conceptually broken, all the research in the world, even if it's done perfectly, is not going to fix that. Uh, as you, I'm sure, know in your life, a bad movie, a bad TV show is a bad movie and a bad TV show, and there's not much you can do about it. Um, so what can be done early on? And so one thing we uh, decided to do is I took the companies that I had and I focused them on learning what all this had 15 terabytes of consumer data, what all this data was telling us, what, what the consumer was actually telling us about narrative, about, about, about the films that they were seeing and the TV shows they were seeing. And we broke it down into the sub-archetypes. So I don't know how many are familiar with uh, the Joseph Campbell idea of archetypes. Um, well, it turns out that in all this data, there are actually, th we had found around 350 of these sub-archetypes. So to give some examples, these are about expectations that you almost subconsciously have while watching content. So if, you, if, you're, if you're watching a horror movie, horror movies could either be a haunting or a killing. There's no other type of horror movie, right? You're, you're something, someone's either getting haunted or you actually have a killer. Um, and if you have a haunting, it's, it's either gonna be a demon or a ghost, right? And if it's a demon, they're either summoned or, you know, someone sold their soul when they were a kid or something like that, right? Like, there's two, there's only, they really only coast that. If you have a killer, you have different types of killers. You have killers as creatures. You have multiple killers. You have uh, killers that you don't know who they are until the end. So let's say you have a movie that has multiple killers, like The Strangers. I don't know how many have seen The Strangers, but like it's a multiple killer movie. If you have a movie with multiple killers, the killers have to be insane. Uh, and by insane, I mean they can't have any motive. They can't want to sell your organs or hold you hostage. They just have to want to kill you because you're there, because psychologically that's where the fear comes from. The moment there's a motive involved, uh, the moviegoer classifies as it as a suspense thriller and not a horror movie. Um, and so, you know, if you're reading a script 
and uh, multiple killers, and all of a sudden they put in a motive is they're, you know, they're gonna hold them hostage or they, they revenge for some reason, but it's clearly trying to sell it as a horror movie, well, that's a mistake. And that, that comes at a cross-genre purpose with, with moviegoer. And so when you code all these movies and you start running statistical models on them, it turns out that if you make slight changes, you can dramatically affect the box office uh, impact. Well, what had happened was uh, New York Times ran a piece on this, uh, cover New York Times, all that, and I started getting death threats from, the, from like, writers, <laughs> literally hundreds and hundreds of death threats uh, that I was killing art. Uh, you can't algorithm art. Um, Blah, 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 all that stuff. Um, and what one they didn't understand was the process in Hollywood does not protect art at all. Like, you know, unless you're Christopher Nolan, your script is going to go through so many revisions. And by the time, if you're lucky enough for it to get purchased, it goes to the studio, it's completely out of your hands. And if you think that you have the ability to make changes, you're, you're lucky if you're one voice in a room of 50 um, who are all making changes. So what I was proposing was, well, if I could tell you that ending's gonna be changed. The audience is gonna to object to that ending. All the data indicates the audience will object to that ending. You can make the change now while you still have control over your own passion and your own project, or you can let some head of production somewhere make it. Um, a choice is yours, right? So that was the, the first thing we focused on and wound up doing assessments on over 250 scripts. Um, in District 9 was the very first one we did it on, um, all the way up through American Sniper and, and all down. So. Um, and predicting the box office on them and using them. Uh, the second area was in the area of marketing, where it also astonished me that people would spend 50 to $75 million on marketing a film in P called P&A, um, prints and advertising. And you know, you'd say, all right, we spent $50 million on it, 25 million worked, we don't know which 25 it was. Uh, and this enormous waste is occurring. Now, it seems that in the last few weeks, micro-targeting has become a bit of a dirty word or something, because Cambridge Analytica did some, something whatever. Like yeah, yeah, you know what, stop taking quizzes on Facebook. <laughs> How about that? You know what, and, and if there's terms and conditions, read them. But, fine. Uh, so, people are upset because they're, de you know what, if you turn off all that stuff in Facebook, you're going to start getting ads for adult diapers and wondering why the hell you're getting them because, trust me, you like micro-targeting. You want micro-targeting. It gives you the ads that you actually want to see. It works. Um, if you turn that stuff off, you're going to start getting a whole bunch of crap that you never want and never, never even thought you wanted uh, appearing in your feed and in your status feed. Um, and, uh, you know, Everyone thinks, well, you're taking my data and my information. It, nobody cares about anybody individually, unless you're like some sort of Russian spy or something, right? Um, which these days, maybe you could be. But um, in aggregate is what matters, and people can be profiled in aggregate. So what the other idea was to combine this genre information with all this micro-targeting information, and then you could bring that to targeting uh, moviegoers. Uh, for movies, but not only targeting where they are what they, and, and what they look at, but how they want to see it, how they want to construct it. All right, I have a movie about the apocalypse, and it's about the apocalypse is uh, occurring, and instead of trying to stop the apocalypse and trying to escape the apocalypse, well, then you normally need a divorced father protecting his, uh, his kids. Um, 2012, day after tomorrow, it's all the same plot, right? It's like dad's coming and he's protecting it, the same thing. And there are certain things you need to highlight in the trailer for that. Uh, but if someone has a psychological profile that, that indicates that what they like is um, not uh, more family-oriented, but what they're looking for is more action-oriented, then you can focus on other elements in the trailer. And you can literally micro-target the person down to their psychographic profile and not spend 50 to $75 million and throw it against the wall. So once I had those two things, um, all I then needed was roughly $500 million to uh, start my own studio, um, and uh, you know, to start your own studio, you don't you don't just need production, but you also need to get your own distribution apparatus because you need to distribute the movies in the theater, and you need foreign sales, and you need uh, a marketing team and a production team. You need all of that and a huge staff, and so you know, someone who doesn't really have soft communication skills, uh, uh, getting five hundred million dollars, it, it took what about a year, Jack? I think it took you. 
And I still owe you a couple bucks. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. About a little, a little bit over a year. a year. Uh, but we did it. Um, and so, yeah, in 45 days, we will, we will open doors to Solstice Studios, which will be announced probably within the next few weeks, um, and put to test these ideas that you, if you use information correctly and understand the consumer psychologically uh, from a data point of view of where they're coming from and what they're looking for and what they need, you can give them in terms of content that is both playable, meaning they're gonna enjoy it, and marketable, meaning it's easy to reach them. And if you can do that and do it well, um, you can take, you can mitigate a lot of risk in what is normally a risky industry, uh, which is entertainment. So that's, that's my thing. Okay, so the, um, the title, in addition to the Golden Age, was Applied Media Analytics. And in some ways, and in today's marketing world, right, you take that and you put a period after each of them, because that's what people do now, right? Applied, <laughs> period, <laughs> media, period, analytics. So we're gonna t deal with each of those three words separately and how they come together. And we're gonna start at the back end. Um, analytics. What is analytics as opposed to research? What's the difference? What, how, and we, interesting, don't work together directly because you guys are in separate. Yep. They ought, they absolutely should work together. Mm -hmm. And Vinny, you're about to build it. So talk, it's your topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. So actually before I worked in analytics, I used to work in market research. I uh, used to work in market research at ESPN. And so I always had an, understanding of what that space was, um, it started to become clear to me that there was a, there was a next level uh, that we could take uh, some of the data that we could play with. Um, so one of the things that happened to me pretty quickly is I was working at SVN and as I mentioned earlier, we were collecting a survey tracker. So every day we're surveying people, you know, what are your favorite teams, what are your favorite athletes, what are your favorite players? And I started to think about that data set uh, and you hear the term big data. Um, I don't know if that really constitutes, but we've maybe a couple thousand surveys a year, 30 years, it's not, it's not small uh, to say the least. And so I started to think, well, you know, if we looked at 30 years of, of data, uh, we have an understanding of TV ratings. Uh, we have an understanding of how shows actually performed on air. Um, our ratings of our shows with people just sitting behind the desk, kind of similar to this, uh, what was happening with live events. Uh, it was definitely a time at ESPN where people were worried about what might happen with subscription fees, et cetera. So I thought to myself that it made a lot of sense to try to understand to what extent does this survey data help us understand, help us forecast, uh, how can we then build segmentation models? How do we then combine that with what we know? We have minute by minute TV ratings to really understand. And when I put that challenge forward to, to my manager who ran the market research department, uh, he said, you know, this is a really interesting idea. I think someone should look at this, but I don't necessarily know if that's us. Uh, and so I think that was really my uh, idea, that I think there was a space there where my interests and skill sets could reside that was slightly out of market research. So to take the question more directly, Jack, uh, I think what we're dealing with today and why the analytic space is, is different is, one, a lot of the things that we work with are behavioral. Uh, so it's, it's different than the challenges of how do you feel about things. I think if you look historically, you, if market research was your only tool, you would send someone a survey to say, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, what did you do last week? That's not really the core of where you should be leaning on market research, but it was the data that you had. And I think today in analytics, uh, we can look and say, you know, what are people looking at? What videos are they watching online? What are they talking about? We can actually collect behavioral information. The problem with that very quickly is it just becomes a ton of data. If you think about all of the searches that are happening on Google, uh, the YouTube, all of the posts that are on Facebook, you realize very quickly that one, you need a large engineering team to be able to just get all of that data in one place to analyze. Then when you start thinking about the volume of that data, uh, you need a level of statistical expertise that exists in market research department, departments, but to Patricia's point earlier, really not a ton of film ones or content ones historically, you had to get that together. Uh, so I think the combination of skill sets where you talk about uh, some engineering skill sets, then you talk about the statistics end of it, um, and then the ability to tell a story, all of those skill sets needed to be in one place, and I think that's really where the analytics department really filled the gap uh, in some of the areas where you know market research historically really wasn't playing. Um, I mean, I, I look and think, um, to me, market research is sort of, from looking out at this audience, there's 
32 of you, 16 of you are male, 30, 16 female, um, looking at that data in a crosstab and saying, okay, how can we take that data and, and give it to the people who run this conference to help them decide in terms of how to advertise, uh, you know, going forward or make changes. And analytics to me is more about predicting exactly what you're gonna do after you leave this room. Um, how many of you are gonna go gamble? How many of you are gonna go, you know, to lunch? How many of you are gonna go do a social engagement? Um, what are you going to say to other people? And what are those people gonna say to other people? And so on. Um, so uh, to me, that, that, that's the difference for me. But, yeah. So w when, when did they come together? And what kind of conflicts do you have in trying to bring those two together in a real life situation? Yeah, I'll, I'll start on this one. That's a great question. Um, there are often conflicts between analytics and market research, no doubt. Um, I think one of the reasons that, they, that there are conflicts is people are, haven't always had a great understanding as to when to use what, right? There are some things for which you want to look at analytics and some things for which you want to look at market research. I don't want to use market research to tell me how often somebody goes to Facebook, right? I want to look at my analytics. If it's about behavior, if it's about what something actually does, use analytics for that. Market researchers cannot tell you that, right? Because people lie occasionally. Or people have bad memories, right? If I asked you, how many times did you go to Facebook in the past month? You would go, um, 15? When it was actually like 172, right? Um, so I think that's where the conflicts are, Understand for me understanding what data set to use for what. If you want to understand why someone's doing something, if you want to understand them as people, if you want to really kind of get in and talk with people and um, understand kind of the mindset of people, that's a different question that analytics can't always answer. Um, I was in the state of Florida um, about three months before Donald Trump was elected, talking with people, not even about politics. I was just talking to people about their lives. And had I took that knowledge and then looked at how close the polls were, I would have said, Hillary's not gonna win, right? But I looked at the polls and I believed only the polls. And I kind of put aside that other piece of information from me actually sitting and talking with consumers that was telling me that there was something else going on. Um, so these things have to be used in concert um, when it's appropriate to. So in my job, I try to predict what skill sets, what methods, what techniques, um, the industries that we serve want. And part of that prediction is listening. Part of that prediction is kind of getting a sense of the questions we're being asked, and then how do we solve them? How do we help companies solve their problems? And in the last, I'll say 10 years, um, the, the trend has gone like this. And there is big data and analytics for sure, but I also see a trend towards anthropological, one-on-one -on -one understanding of people. How do, how do you, at a company, how do you bring those two things together? Because I know companies are doing both. How does that work? I think, um, well, first, so um, I think it makes sense that the world is, is moving that way. Uh, when you think about, uh, to Patricia's earlier point, when survey was your only tool and you needed to answer every question, I, I hear all the time that, you know, you, let's say you're setting up a survey, you used to set up a lot of surveys, you'll work with a partner and say, uh, marketing team, what are the things you want to know? Then you'll get a list of hundreds of things they would like to know. The problem is, generally speaking, only 10% of that list can be actually answered by a survey. Uh, but historically, you've tried to answer the entire list with one survey. Um, and I think what's happened is as companies have added analytics teams, they start to be a little bit better about understanding what are the things that we should be analyzing with analytics, what are the things we should be analyzing with more traditional market research methods. And as you think about it, market research is best positioned to understand the motivations un underneath well, what someone yeah. is doing. So if you think about uh, that initial point where you had one tool, the logical next step 
is to move the, the two departments, maybe they're the same, maybe they're different departments depending on where you work, into what they do best. So to move analytics towards uh, trying to forecast how many ticket sales you're gonna sell this weekend, uh, to move analytics towards trying to get an understanding of to what a sense you've kind of pierced through the zeitgeist as you get closer to opening weekend. And then market research is best positioned to understand what are the things that people are looking for in movies? Why do people have to make the decision to not watch Netflix, but to leave their house? What is it about the communal event of going to watch something in screen? So those are the things that you really want to know. And if you really want to focus there, a 20 question survey isn't really the place. The place is, let's sit down, let's talk, let's understand. So to your point, Jack, of moving that way, I think that's the logical place. And I think ultimately that's Beth's position than where we are right now, where we, I think we have a lot of overlapping duties and, and a lot of organizations where both teams are trying to answer the same questions and don't really have an understanding of who's best positioned to answer them. I don't know if you And have because they're not on the same team, they might not even understand they're trying to answer the same questions. I also think that um, uh, growing technology and advancements in things like AI, that if you look at statistical techniques like agent-based modeling, for example, and agent-based modeling is, uh, you know, picture, everyone's familiar with The Sims, like the game The Sims, right? Um, picture uh, creating a Sims world where you can program your Sims character to have all the characteristics you want them to have, their age, their gender, their psychological profile, their likeliness to tell someone else and, uh, about a video they just saw and liked, what percent chance they have, and so on. And picture all the information that, that market research and analytics can feed into that to, to program these sims, these little simulations. Um, and then you could ask that program, that agent-based modeling program, a question. If I show this particular trailer, which I know has an X propensity to create this much interest, to this type of person, what will be the domino effect? How many people will that person go tell, and that person go tell, and that person go tell? And you could start watching it spiral. So I think as these techniques, and particularly as AI begins to grow, and, and computing power begins to grow, um, I'm always trying to remove the human component, right? Um, <laughs> you, you can, you can uh, combine a lot of these things that you're talking about and create accurate simulations. Um, as long though, as you said before, garbage in, garbage out, as long as the information that you are programming into the sims is accurate. And the only way to get that information is through e either attitudinal data, behavioral data, um, you know, to, to, you know, if, if, as long as the data that you're getting on people is reflective of who they are. And like you said, people lie on surveys or they have faulty memories or they lie. And, um, <laughs> you really don't like people, do you? No, God, no. <laughs> How could you? I mean, really, I know. anyway. I, I, get, I get it. But um, a, you have to then divide, but I mean, it, by the way, it's fine if people lie, as long as they lie in a consistent, predictable manner. <laughs> That's the whole point of statistics. As long as you consistently lie and you lie in a predictable manner, lie away. It's fine, I'll know you're lying and we can just control for that, that's easy. Uh, but is, you, know, you program those things in and you account for those things, and you even account for a percent lying factor in there, and you start getting accurate predictions of what's going to happen. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's all about trying, you know, no matter what technique you use, whether it's a, a more personal anthropological technique or, 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 or statistical technique, it's, it's really all about trying to understand people and predict them in, in what they're going to do in large groups and how they're going to respond to something. And yes, obviously the goal is to, to make money. Uh, the better you predict people, the better you'll make money. But here's the great thing about the entertainment industry. You don't make money in the entertainment industry unless you entertain people, right? So, um, you know, when, when people are like, well, that's a terrible motive to make profit. Well, well, just think the end result of that means the more profit the entertainment industry makes generally is because more people were entertained. Uh, so that, that, that I'm, you know, I'm okay with that goal. Jack, how are we on time? Uh, we have 25 minutes. Okay, so, because I want to tell a, a quick story about this last topic, Jack, if you don't mind. Um, when you have an analytics team and a market research team that can work together on projects, there is enormous opportunity there. I want to tell you about a project that I worked on at Scripps, and they've been out publicly with this project, so there's no, um, in, you know, nothing proprietary here. Every four years, Scripps business was a really good business because they own TV stations in Florida, Ohio, Wisconsin, Michigan, 
Nevada, Arizona. Are these places that you hear a lot about every four years? Yes, that's why the business is cyclical. Revenue, four years, down, up, down. Um, so we were, they did, build a model out of their DC sales office. They have an office in DC that does all their political sales. They're very unique in that regard. They put a lot, all the different inputs that went into this were, had one goal and one goal only. Determine what media mix and media spend would increase voter turnout by state for Senate races, mostly for Senate races, because we weren't a nationwide business, so we weren't doing a ton of nationwide campaign work, although obviously Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, you gotta win those states if you wanna be president of the United States. So the inputs were all the media spends from external um, providers. You then also had to understand what would motivate people to get to the polls, and you have to understand that by asking them. What's important to you? On a scale of one to five, how important is it? Here's this candidate's statement on this issue. How closely does it match your position on that issue? How much of a motivator to go to the polls is that issue? All of that information, again, the market research and the analytics together went into that model. The product of that model, again, spend X, voter turnout goes up by Y. It was also a predictive model in terms of winning elections. Every Senate race we put it against, it was right. It was also correct on the popular vote in the presidential race, even though we were not a nationwide company and we did not poll nationwide. Put those two sides of the house together and there's enormous power there. That's a good story, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna move to media, analytics dot, move that aside. When you, when you, so media analytics, right? We talk about it, you live it, you're in it, but when, what, using Dr. Stansberry's line, every company's a media company, every company should be a data company. When you think of media, what do you think? What, what, what are the levers that you guys feel like you have at your disposal to accomplish what you want to do on a, on a marketing and a communication standpoint? Great question. <laughs> you want to go or you want me to Ooh, go? Oh, I stumped him. <laughs> I, I, I can start on this Go one. for it. Uh, so from a, a tactic standpoint, really open, opening a movie, we have all of the tools that, you know, as consumers you see. So. You might see a billboard, you might see an ad online, you might see you know, something on TV. Um, we have really all of those, all of those tools at our disposal. Um, I think on the media side, uh, taking it to the data space, it's interesting because you might have different ways of reaching consumers, but the sophistication with which you can measure uh, to what extent you've done that really varies. Mm -hmm. So if you're, right now, if you're talking about a you know, billboard, um, like say, let's say on the strip, um, if there were a m movie billboard there, there's not at the moment really sophisticated ways. What you can do is you can get an understanding of how many cars typically drive by, but what you really can't measure well is if this was digital, you'd call it viewability. So the idea that like percentage of people are actually viewing it and taking the content in. Um, and then you take a step a little bit further with TV, you can get an understanding of the impressions you've delivered. Um, and there are some partners, uh, not to use vendors, Jack, there's some partners that have ways of trying to get an understanding of where people are using a second screen on their phone, where they're trying, where they're paying attention during the commercial. But generally in the TV space, what you have is, you know, we've delivered impressions. The one place where we have a little bit more sophistication is in the digital space. What's really great about the digital space is, to Vinny's earlier point, the, the targeting capabilities. Um, even if you didn't want to get very micro-targeted, you could work with a, a Facebook, you could work with a Google and say, I just want to speak to this type of person. Um, and they have all of, they have the data and they make informed decisions of, you know, we think this person is a 23-year-old male uh, that lives in Chicago. So if you just wanted to target to those people, you could. And what's great about that is if you wanted to measure on the back end, you know, to what percent actually viewed, um, what percent did something, did they comment on it, did they like it, did they share it, uh, how did my share rates, my like rates, my view rates, um, did people search? Uh, how did my search rates, my Google search rates, how do they compare with different groups? Uh, so I think it's very interesting where at the moment you have a mix, but the ways you can measure it are very different. Um, and interestingly enough, they don't always, the spend doesn't always align with how measurable it is. Uh, TV, for most me please play partners in the media space, are the vast majority of the spend. 
um, and digital is a smaller part. And, and so generally you might use your digital data to try to get an understanding of the entire landscape. But just from a measurement standpoint, if the only thing you cared about was having the best, um, if every impression gave you the most information, you get the most information per impression on a digital spend. Um, but that's just not where the bulk of the money is, is spent. Um, I'd say yet, but. I think also what, what media and analytics does really well is, you know, gives you that measurement of impact for any individual piece of media, right? But we all know in, in our everyday lives that there, there are certain things where if you see a trailer for something, you decide right away, I want to see that, right? Maybe it was like a quiet place that just came out. Like you see it, you clicked, I want to see that, I'm going to go see that. But there are other things where it's the mix of media, where you, you reached a critical mass, where I saw a billboard, now I just saw something in my Facebook feed, now I just saw a TV commercial for it. And, and it's the combination effect of that mix of all those different impressions that are hitting you that finally hit a critical mass, and then it, then you're at a point where if one person that you know and, and, and trust recommends it to you, it's gonna push you over the edge, right? That's what's more difficult to measure. It's more difficult to measure what the right mix and what the impact of that mix is. Very easy to say, okay, this commercial had this impact on you and moved you closer to a decision or not decision. But at the end of the day, if you're not one of those lucky pieces of content that has that instant impact, you see the trailer, oh yeah, I wanna see that, but instead it takes a lot of buildup to get you to cross over to actually go to see something or, or purchase money, to, you, know, you spend money to purchase something. Um, it, it's what is the impact of all those things coming together, a media mix uh, model. That is more difficult to measure, uh, what the right media mix is and, and where that critical mass is, and, and, and for each person has a different critical mass, and you want to get people to, the, to that point quick as quick as possible. Um, but uh, individually, one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, it's very easy to tell, okay, this Facebook ad had this impression on you and made you closer to this decision, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, kind of the, the holy grail of advertising right now is multi-touch attribution, right? Kind of getting to what he's talking about. Where, where is that kind of point where it's all together? Rather than just last touch attribution, right? It was the digital ad that I clicked on, so that gets the credit because I can't put the rest of the parts and pieces together. As multi-touch attribution comes to fruition, I think it's completely going to change the game for how marketing is spent in the U.S. Mm -hmm. One other thing I, I'd add to that is you might read in the, the press and the trades and the content space about some of the sophistication uh, Netflix is making in the strides there, uh, Hulu. Uh, one of the things that you won't always read in Variety and Deadline is, and I think it's really important to think about in this space is, to Vinny's earlier point, is if you can look and say, you know, this person saw this ad, they saw this ad, and then they did something. Mm -hmm. They actually clicked on and they subscribed. They signed up for Hulu, they signed up for Netflix. Uh, in the TV space, in the film space, even different challenge. So if we have a billboard, we have an ad, uh, that person then leaves their house and then goes to the movies, uh, that conversion, that actually buying, that moment of purchasing something in the TV space, in the film space, is very difficult to measure. Uh, no one has it fully measured. Uh, so some people are either halfway there or 25% of the way there. And so uh, to Patricia's earlier point of garbage in, garbage out, if you're a film studio, if you're a TV network, you can say, you can trick yourself to believe I have a hundred percent understanding of who turned, who saw my ad and who went to the movies, but that'll probably lead you in a path when you really don't know what's going on there um, to try to follow the, the, the ways that Netflix and Hulu are moving that have an actual guaranteed conversion. So one of the things that we try to focus on at Paramount is to be very honest and direct with ourselves on the analytics side of what are the things that we know, what are the things that we don't know, what are the things, the data sources we trust, what are the ones that we don't, because I think as an analytics organization that to my earlier slide, they have to talk to so many different teams and partners. I think the worst thing that we can do is tell our internal partners that we understand the world in a way that we do not. Uh, so we're really focused on, we know this and we're very comfortable telling our teams, we don't know yet. We're, we're making investments, we're buying credit card data, we're buying whatever it might be, um, but we're not there yet. And I think it also, when you, when you say you don't know with our, a lot of our partners, I think it also helps us uh, earn trust over time. That's a fantastic transition because I want to go to applied, but I don't necessarily, which is the decision making part. And we have educators here and we have students here. We've talked about telling stories. We've talked about creating insights. Just talk about the challenge of telling people their baby's ugly 
um, telling mm -hmm. people that, but if you take this path, he or she might be a little prettier in six months. Um, there's a political, there's a, an interpersonal side to delivering both good and bad news. And, and so from a skill set standpoint, whether they're hard or soft or just general skills, Talk, talk, yeah, talk, <laughs> talk to the educators about what they should be teaching and talk to the kids about what they should be mastering. Um, so I'm going to start with this on this one. Telling someone they are wrong or that their baby is ugly is one of the greatest challenges that, that anybody has to, to face. Um, I had to do it a lot. Um, I had to tell people that marketing they'd spent like weeks working on that was going to run in the Super Bowl wasn't going to work and they had to do a different spot when the Super Bowl was like a week away kind of thing. Um, generally speaking, when I had to deliver bad news, um, one, I talked about the product. There was n there's never a discussion of the process behind it, right? Because the process behind it is what? It's the people who made the spot, right? Um, you'll never be more uncomfortable than if you're sitting in a focus group and someone's watching, like people are, focus groups are watching stuff and the people who created the content are behind you and people are like, this sucks. And the people in the back are like, oh my God. It's the worst. Um, you have to remember it's about the product and the content, not about the people who created it. Um, when I have to deliver bad news, it was normally, I was very specific about how we went through getting the data so people understand that there was a real process that we went through. It wasn't something I made up. They needed to, you, they kind, you, kind, you kind of have to set it up that bad news is coming, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they're like, okay, but you can't just jump right in and go, that was, it doesn't work. You have to set it up. It did this, we did this. Here was the outcome about this product. Outcomes and products, nothing about people, nothing about process. I think also this is, um where my training as a, a sociologist overcame my misanthropic nature, where um, that every a culture or you know industry, a tight knit industry, has its own culture, um, its own language that that it uses. And what I would advise people getting into an industry or so in teaching people who are getting into industry is to understand what that culture is, understand what that language is, and speak that language. Um, because particularly the entertainment industry is, is almost known to the point of being stereotyped for it, where um, it has its own code of ethics, its own rules that it abides by. The, you'll find the meetings that take place there are very different tonally than it would be in almost any other industry in the world. I don't know how it's been for you for transitioning to the, to the banking world. Oh, too. yes. It, very much the same. Very different. Yes. Um, and so, and, uh, you know, knowing what those rules and mores are and all of that going in and speaking the language could make your transition much better. I've seen very, very brilliant people who have very, you know, the great points and and they are, are dead on the money but they didn't speak the language and so they were literally laughed out of the room and I've seen, seen absolute idiots who have no idea what they're talking about and this is by far the majority of the people uh, come in and they uh, get widely embraced simply because they speak the language uh, and they know how to speak the language of the room they are in and they read the room so if you're delivering news particularly bad news particularly news someone doesn't want to hear um, and you understand, like, you know, in content, usually no one sets out to make bad content. It, it happens that way, but no one sets out to do it. They truly do believe that this is a, an unbelievable piece of art that they've just spent years of their life and money and time putting their heart and soul into. They don't want, and, and they're generally surrounded by people who tell them that, yes, 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 this is amazing, this is incredible. They don't want to hear what you're going to tell them. So knowing that language and knowing how to communicate that language is, is essential. I've seen entire careers based on, on the mastery of that. Um, so that, that is one of the most foremost things I would teach people is, is know the language and the culture that you're getting into for the industry you're getting into particularly if it's involving data analytics and ugly babies and so on. No, you I think that's all, all of the, the things that I would say uh, is understand the culture 100% agree with Vinny. I, I just talk about one experience in particular, uh, being on the market research team at ESPN where we would do a lot of show testing. Uh, so she was talking about being in the back room with the actual show creator. 
Uh, but then also we had to present it to the talent. So it's one thing to talk about the, <laughs> the producer, but then you have to hear what fans say about um, different anchors, announcers, and then you have to stand in front of those people. And I was a very big sports fan growing up, so standing in front of people that I'd watch on TV, uh, former athletes I'm really big fans of, and then how do you pass information of uh, people say that they don't like when you talk about X, or people think that you talk too much. Uh, so I think one of the things that we really focused on was to always make it about the show. So if we were gonna pass information about a talent specifically, we would say, in the example of, um, won't say the show or the person, but we'll say, but we'll say in the example of someone that you know the fans really said they really just talk too much on this particular show. We'd always say we would bring it to them as collectively for all of the people on the desk. It's really important that the conversation moves. So let's all work together to make sure that the conversation doesn't stick. And we actually would then say we'd show a clip. Um, not of the person we're trying to communicate this to, <laughs> of someone else that offends less often, and just to say like, oh, you know, the conversation didn't stick. And so I think that's the way is when you focus it on the show, the business, and as opposed to what one person yeah. isn't doing, what one person should be doing, um, that's helpful. It doesn't always go well. No. Like I, I've been in situations <laughs> where we've tried to do it that way, and the person very quickly understood that you were talking about them. Um, and then I've actually had a situation where they've actually like, They've stopped listening, tried to take up their cell phone, and then you try to like, so sometimes it doesn't always go well, right. but I think the idea of one, making it about the team and not about the person, and to Vinny's point, understanding the culture, understanding the languages. When we would go, we'd always talk about A block, B block, C block. We would always talk, the, speak the language, and talk about the things that the production teams always talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think that at least gets you 80% of the way there, but not always 100%. Product, not people. All right, perfect timing. Time for questions. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, Questions? Yeah. 
Uh, yes, the question is about, um, we've, I think, spoken pretty um, specifically about U.S., but Paramount and many other companies are international companies. And so as, as Jamal and his team at Paramount are looking at interpreting data, acquiring data, how do you um, extend that into other markets? How do you get the data from the other markets so that your practices are consistent across the globe? Yeah, absolutely. That's a really, it's funny. It's a great question and also extremely relevant. Uh, so it was just a couple weeks ago we were showing a new tool uh, in Tableau where we can get an understanding of box office and granular level, get the theater level, um, and we presented it in you know the weekly meeting. Uh, we showed a domestic version, uh, then we showed a UK version, and we immediately got emails and messages from all teams all over the globe of we want this, and you know we're a central analytics team, so we say you know we'll work on it, and so we tried to go find all the data sources, and as you suspected. It's missing. Um, there are certain countries where you can only see your box office data for your film. Other places where it looks like no one's updated this thing in at least like a year and a half. Uh, so very, what happens to us very quickly is when you talk about scale, we always thought that you know, you'd build something domestic and then it'd be very easy to scale. Um, and often it's just not. So you know, people always think domestic and international, what we've learned, and it was the same thing when I was at Netflix is that you think domestic, then you think international. I think the culture at Netflix had a really good understanding. It's not that. It's what are we doing in the United States? What are we doing in the UK? What are we doing in France? What are we doing in Germany? What are you doing in Korea? And our team is really focused and has learned hard lessons trying to just scale everything. And then beyond just the tools, there's also culture. So the way that we tell stories are different. Uh, do we put the methodology in the front of the deck? Do we leave it to the end? Do we just leave it out because they trust us implicitly? All of those things are very important and you actually, you only learn them um, from working with local teams. So we try to rely on the local markets because they have a good understanding of the pulse, the way to tell stories. We don't always get them right, but we at least use their expertise. And I would hope that in the future, you know, a year from now, two years from now, we'd be comfortable talking to any regional team and being able to, to Vinny's earlier point, speak their language and hopefully pass on the same stories, but it's not easy at all. It's interesting. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, one of the reasons I was drawn to, because that was a challenge um, of trying to predict uh, box office success, based, particularly in an early stage. One of the things that drew me to the concept of archetypes is that by definition, archetypes are very unchanging, right? Uh, some of these archetypes have been around for thousands of years. Um, we're subconsciously drawn to certain types of stories. But you're correct in that what we found were there were some culturally specific archetypes and some uh, long-standing archetypes. So, for example, you know, uh, a long-standing. If we take a romantic comedy, right? For example, um, we found that there are certain things that are uh, going to be continuous and and the same. If you look at data from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to today, uh, during the breakup scene, the the best friend's job is always to support the lead character, right? And if they're not, people reject the best friend character. But um, what we found is that it used to be, for example, during that breakup, uh, the male character could go and the double standard existed. Uh, the male character could go and sleep with whoever they wanted, and the audience is like, yeah, whatever, that's fine, guys do that. But if she went and slept with someone else during the breakup scene, oh my God, and even other women in the audience would be like, oh, she can't do that, that's just wrong, right? Um, and then you have a movie like Trainwreck that comes out and changes the paradigm. Um, so because of a cultural shift, in, in the way that's perceived. That normal expectation, which would have been sort of written into the tropes and rules of a romantic comedy, changed uh, because culturally it changed. So one thing that we do, uh, particularly in this data set, is we identify clearly 
uh, the ones that, um, when looking at a trend analysis over a 10, 15 year period, has stayed absolutely consistent, and the ones that have moved. Um, and then we tried to do a cultural anthropological study as to why have those things moved? Um, why are people less or more accepting of this narrative or that narrative as opposed to not? And then, then we look psychographically and demographically at Okay, well, you know what? Uh, believe it or not, you know, red state people and so are, are still not accepting if she sleeps with someone, but other people are. And then we start actually having to look at what type of people has it moved for. And then even to go further in that is, are there certain people that are predictive of a larger wave of people? So once you start seeing this group of people starting to accept a change or a cultural change, it is predictive that a year from now, it's going to be a larger wave of people accepting it or these are just an isolated event and it's not going to expand outside that. So it is, it's a constant uh, struggle to, to try to figure out what's stable and what's gonna be dynamic. <laughs> my reaction, uh, just as a researcher, uh, adjunctively to broadcast that is that I constantly, and, I'm, and it's not exaggeration, I'm always seeing questionable sources of data. My issue isn't so much the data and all it's it's where the heck are these data and information? Garbage in, garbage out. Well, not only that, but the people using the garbage should be known that they're using garbage. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you about this, because I, I mean, I've been in a million focus groups, and all this is lovely and wonderful. One quick thing about your polls, I know we're running short on time. First of all, Americans like winners and losers, right? We don't like things ending up in ties. It's hard for us to accept that when we see 45 and 42, that the person who has 45 is not winning. It's just hard for us to accept. It's so my theory of why soccer maybe isn't as important <laughs> as, um, like, Americans don't like sports that end in ties, right? I used to work at NASCAR. If we had a race that ended in a tie, people would revolt, right? Um, you know, and again, that's data education. Right? So often, like the margin of, if, if there's a big graphic about a poll, the, the graphic is in like 60 point type, and then the margin of error is in like two point type at the bottom, right? That's about educa education for people. And I, you know, I, I think it's part of it's a cultural thing that, that we just like this person wins and this person loses. I think part of it's also. Over here. I just want to address that really quick. Part, part of it's also the, the combination of a, of a business need versus a reality and a science need. If you're running a research company and your client comes to you and says, um, I'm going to give you $400,000 to run a bunch of focus groups on this, and you go, well, qualitative information is not the best way to get your answer here. 15 people in Burbank on a Tuesday night is not exactly going to be representative of the United States in this case. <laughs> yeah, but we think it is. So will you do it? If not, we're going to go to another company. Yeah, sure, we'll do it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, the part of it's just a business need of exactly. <laughs> yeah, you caveat it, but you take the money. Mm. At least to your focus groups in Kansas City, you know. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Something. No? Last question. Both. <laughs> but no, I mean, I think your, Maddie, I think your, your second statement is where I would go. You know, never in a million years, five years ago, did I think I would be working at the fifth largest bank in America. Nope. You, I would have never believed you. Um, do not limit yourself, um, is my advice. I also think the opportunities are, so I think historically, if you had that background, you'd be a data analyst, 
Uh, but what's interesting is, is data has become a bigger part of decision making in every single team. There's going to be a point where you can't be a manager in a marketing team. You can't be a manager in probably 80% of the teams if you don't have an understanding of data. Uh, so if you have an interest that's outside of just of data, just data analysis, uh, that skill set will be incredibly valuable, and I think at some point mandatory, irregardless of what division you're going to play. I would I would just end on this to your question is um, also what they said, but follow your passion. Um, I mean. When I grew up, I was obsessed and still am with obsessed with the idea of predicting human behavior. I read Isaac Asimov's Foundation series and the idea that that main character could develop a science of predicting human behavior. And I just continually took a path through academics and then through movies, which has an opening weekend, which has a dependent that you can constantly use for prediction. I continually follow the path that led me to a place where I can develop and techniques and, and products and science to predict human behavior. So whatever that goal is in your mind, whatever that whatever it is that you want to do, the path may be indirect. It may not be a direct route. Um, but as long as you stay on the path to reaching that, that's what I'd recommend. It's kind of idealistic, and but still. They're students. That's what we are. Yeah. That's right. It won't be idealistic for long, and it'll be burned out. So enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much. Yeah.